Hello, everyone, and welcome to Talking Twists, where I talk about whatever I want that's twist-related and answer some questions submitted by fellow Twist fans. Happy October, everyone! This is my favorite month of the year because I love Halloween and horror. But I like Twist and I'm queer, so you guys probably already knew I like scaly things. So originally, I was going to talk about the localization, but I was getting a little too mean in that. So instead, I'm going to imagine what Twist attractions could be built at the theme parks, but focusing on Disneyland since that's my home park. D23 happened this year, which for people who are unaware, that's a big Disney event where they make loads of media and theme park announcements. They just announced a new Villains Land for Magic Kingdom, although who knows if that'll actually get built since Disney does love to overpromise. I've been working on a video about theoretical twist attractions for Disneyland since last May, but I've never gotten around to putting it together because of how much concept art I thought I'd have to draw. But now that I have this podcast, I can just describe things in extreme detail, so that's what I'm going to do today. So yeah, I'm just going to read and revise that old script a bit and talk about right ideas. I obviously know this will never happen, not to mention the boycott, but it's fun thinking about this sort of thing for me since Disney theme park history is a huge, huge, huge fascination of mine and has been since I was a child. So first off, there's like no room at Disneyland to build new things. I'm still surprised they were able to do Galaxy's Edge. I know since Ron DeSantis, that fucking dumbass, Thought it'd be a great idea to fuck with Disney. They're now starting to think of expansions in California. But yeah, like, I know there's been proposals and stuff. Uh, my cousin Jeff and I were talking about it at his mom's funeral last May. Um, But I don't really know the exact details. So I'm just going to work with what we got right now in the park. I don't know the exact dimensions of this area, but I would put a mini twist area where Casey Jr. and the storybook boats are. Fuck them kids. No, I just think since Twist is a game that relies heavily on villains, the best area would be in Fantasyland. As cute as Casey Jr. and the boats are, it's time. It's time for them to go. Dumbo can stay, but he's on thin ice. Now, because this area is small and backstage areas would also need to be used for this, making the land as compact and utilitarian as possible is a priority. And while this might sound like a tall order, I actually think it could be a lot easier to pull off than expected. I think, really, we only need three buildings and some grassy areas. In this little area, I would put one meet-and-greet area, two gift shops, one quick service restaurant, one attraction, and one exhibition space in this new little area. This mini land would be an abbreviated version of NRC's campus, so the only buildings would be the main building, Ramshackle, and the mystery shop. So in my plans, if you walked up to the mini land in a straight line from the carousel, first you'll have a little grassy area, and then Main Street, Uh, and then more grass, and then some buildings all sort of in a row. Main Street will be running parallel to the current path there right now that's kind of running from, like, Red Rose Tavern to, like, Alice, like, that sort of horizontal. So, like, they're parallel with each other. But in my opinion, even though that would be a way to get into the land, I think the best way to enter the land would be to walk down NRC's Main Street. So let's go ahead and talk about this little area. So down Main Street's main drag would be the iconic statues we know and love, but also dedicated areas for villain meet and greets. Right now, the villains don't really have their own area in Disneyland, so I feel like having them there would give them their own space and make this area not just for Twist fans, but also for villain fans in general. Although I think twist face characters could be a thing in the future, I think the best option would be a mascot Grimm wandering around take pictures with for some twist representation. But yeah, this area would mostly be open just for meet and greets, hanging out, getting some shade, etc., you know, having snacks, I don't know. There would be grassy areas on either side of the pathway, like I mentioned a couple minutes ago, Um, and there would be, like, some trees and benches for people to just sit and relax, maybe a little bit more um seating, because Red Rose Tavern can kind of fill up pretty quickly. So it would just be kind of like a chill area, you know? Off to the right of NRC's Main Street, there would be one of the gift shops in this area, and, of course, that would be Mr. S's Mystery Shop. I imagine the store filled with both Twist merch and Villains merch. There'd also be a candy slash snack counter since the closest candy counter would be in the way back of Bayou Country. Also, when I first wrote the script, they were still calling it Critter Country, so I had to change that. How fast time flies. Anyways, Glad Splash Mountain is gone. Uh, long live Tiana. She is the best. I love her. But anyways, um, candy counter there. And like, Sam's has one in canon, so like, we might as well put one in here too. Like, I know that's probably going to be, like, fairly close to Red Rose Tavern and Edelweiss Snacks. That's what it's- yeah, it's Edelweiss Snacks. But, like, candy, you know? Um, the building would look how it does in-game. I would add a few more benches and maybe tables with umbrellas off to the side, just so there's some seating if people want to eat their snacks there. 
I know, like, when I would go over to Pooh Corner, like, by Winnie the Pooh and stuff, like, that candy counter I was talking about that's in Bayou Country, um, it just kind of sucked if you had, like, a little snacky treat. Like, they had benches out there, but they were always full and there weren't enough, so I would like to kind of mitigate that with, um, Mr. S's Mystery Shop. So, like, I would like to have quite a bit of seating just so people are, like, there is a place for people to sit, you know, that's not just, like, on the grass. So, moving on from the Mystery Shop, um, if you keep walking down Main Street towards Frontierland, the next building you would see would be uh, Ramshackle Dorm. It's like between the Mystery Shop and then the NRC Main Building. This building is basically just the queue and pre-show for the one attraction in this mini land. And since I'm saving that for last, we're going to move on, but that's there. The largest building in this mini land would be the main NRC building at the end of the uh, NRC Main Street path. Like, again, fairly close to Red Rose Tavern. I, I went over that. It would hold a restaurant exhibition space, various backstage facilities, a little gift shop, and be the show building for the ride I'll talk about later. I know that sounds like a tall order, but I know it could be possible. Uh, but first, let's start with talking about the restaurant. It would be the NRC Cafeteria. Right now, there's only one sort of buffet in the park, but they only do breakfast. So the NRC Cafeteria would be a buffet for all meals, or at least lunch and dinner. Fare would be sandwiches, burgers, ribs, stuff you'd find at U.S. buffets. But the real kicker would be a few sections that rotate out food. Because NRC is a multinational school, this area will have traditional foods from other countries, and it changes every day or every couple days. Um, Like, one day could be Mexican food, the other could be Japanese foods, etc. And, of course, the restaurant would look like NRC's cafeteria, although I'd make the table shorter so one, more can fit in there, and two, you're not having to sit with strangers. So, let's talk about the rest of the building. Over in Japan, tours will have exhibitions where you can go and see the dorm uniforms, concept art, other things, etc. I know I'm saying that a lot, but like, there's just a lot to cover. I'm thinking the castle could be a permanent home to the exhibition, like one of them. Like, one, it would make the exhibit accessible to US fans, but two, it could provide a storage space for all those items, and Disney doesn't have to rent space from someone else to store these items. It's just on their property, and if they're doing another exhibition in Japan, or anywhere else in the world, they can just ship it out. Or this could just be a copy of the Japanese exhibits and Japan keeps theirs, I don't know. But it would be a nice place to peruse franchise-related items and also to cool off from the heat. They could also switch the exhibits out if they wanted to. There are other exhibition spaces in the park, but I don't think it necessarily hurts to have another one. A solid chunk of the castle would be backstage facilities of some kind. I don't know exactly what would need to be replaced by shutting down Casey Jr. and the Storybook Land Canal. Boats? The, gi the giant whale, that that ride. But those things would also need to be in this building, so that way they still exist. Um, I've only ever been backstage behind Toontown, so, like, I don't really know what's in the rest of the park, and even then, I was really only in, like, musical rehearsal spaces, so, like, I don't know what's in that area that would need to be replaced. I've only ever been to that one area, so, like, I don't know. Um, but yeah, the rest of the building is a show building for the Minilands one ride, so let's move on to that. I consider this the crown jewel of my little idea, the area's main attraction, the Blast Cycle Adventure. I was really inspired by the Twilight Motorcycle VR ride in China, so this ride will be using that technology. If you haven't seen it, it's basically a motorcycle-like ride vehicle that's on a little system that moves it. It's similar to the apparatus that moves the Star Tours vehicles, but on a much smaller scale. VR headsets drop down from the ceiling, and from there, it's basically an interactive video game, Think Smuggler's Run, but with VR and a little more personal. Like, you can control everything, and but it's only, like, one person, you know? The queue would start out of the castle in front of Ramshackle Dorm and also, like, in it. Guests would work their way inside. On the second floor are the pre-show rooms. And to make the ride as efficient and inclusive as possible, there will be several pre-show rooms. Guests are taken into Ewing Grimm's room. There will be multiple copies of this room. I think six would be a good option, but potentially more could fit. The differences between this room would mostly be languages. The pre-show would have English, Japanese, and Spanish dubs, all of which are in different rooms with captions available and they can also be switched out. I feel like you could just talk to a cast member and then do that sort of thing. If you have a tour group, that could also be like a thing. There would also be one room where the characters are using American Sign Language and all the action is focused on one screen for ease of viewing. For the non-sign language dubs, the action is split across multiple screens. I'm going to be talking about that experience. When Yu's room fills up, the cast members will close the door and the pre-show will begin. 
So, we all know what a pocket door is, right? It's basically like a door that's built into the wall and it kind of slides in and out. I hate them. They're terrible. Um, I don't want to talk about it. Um, anyway, so I imagine the door for, um, the pre-show room is going to be something kind of similar. So there is a physical door that swings in and out, but attached to this is a mechanism that will actually, like, it will basically, like, if you open the door, it's just like a doorway. But once you close that door, it engages a mechanism that has a kind of secondary door slash screen that will come out of, like, a hidden pocket door thing. So it's like it'll slide out once the door is closed. So it's like hidden screen sort of thing that can, like, easily retract. So, like, in the case of an emergency, it's still easy to get out of the building and have multiple exits. I don't know why I'm thinking about emergency situations in the theoretical, right? <laughs> but apparently I am. Anyways. Um, the pre-show starts with Ace, Deuce, and Grimm coming to Yu's room, appearing in the doorway, and it looks like they've opened the door, which is why there's a screen there. Um, they talk about Deuce having, like, talked with some upperclassmen, and they've gotten blast cycles that they can, like, borrow, and you're all gonna sneak out for a sunset joyride. Ebel shows up at one of the windows, which aren't actually windows, but they're just screens and like, that, like, look like windows, and he's, like, trying to get in. He wants to come along and ride with us. Obviously, the more the merrier. Jack shows up in the doorway to invite himself along and makes fun of Apple for trying to sneak in when the front door is unlocked. Because, like, let's be real here, Yu does not lock that front door. Um, everyone's excited for the ride. Deuce tells Grimm to provide the magic to our blast cycle so we can control it. Before we're about to head out, Sebek appears in the window next to Apple. He's mad we're all sneaking out. He says there's been monster sightings in the woods outside of campus and we shouldn't go there and we should just stay, like, safe. The other guys immediately make fun of him and call him a scaredy cat. Sebek gets big mad about it, and in order to prove he's not a scaredy cat, he, like, kind of invites himself along. With that, Deuce tells everyone to meet up at the front gate. He tells you and Grimm not to get caught sneaking out. Everyone disperses, and the pre-show is over. The large window on the right side of the fireplace, like, you guys know Yu's room, where, like, there's the two big windows on either side of the fireplace? Yeah, so, like, all the screens are going to be on the left one, and then the right one is not, it's kind of like a fake window. But basically, it's a door, and that's how you get out of the room, so it's not like you're constantly going through that one door. So there's, like, a little fake balcony out there with, like, a staircase going down. So guests, like, exit through that way. They go down the staircase and into the second part of the queue. I would like a pre-show room with its own elevator because the whole queue is actually underground uh, after this point. So you're going into Ramshackle, down underneath it, over to the castle. And like I said earlier, the castle is the main show building, like the lower levels of it is. The queue would be a large tunnel, although the lines themselves wouldn't take up the entire space. A lot of the sides would create the illusion of depth, so it looks like you really are sneaking to the front gates of campus. You could do either projections or have screens on the side of the room so you can have, like, fireflies on campus or funny little vignettes to keep people entertained. Anyways, it looks like you're sneaking through a deserted campus. You travel down the path and eventually make it to the split-off area. I would imagine this is going to be more the botanical garden area than, like, the gym and, like, that building that's, like, right in front of the gate that's across from the gym. By this time, guests are at the castle. Cast members will split up parties and direct them to different queues and showrooms. So one route would be going through, like, the rest of Main Street and by the gym, but this isn't every route, so it feels like you're sneaking on campus and not just, like, it's not just the same path, like, split into three parts. It's, like, three different ways to go, all of which are unique and still feel like a chunk of campus. The front gate... That will be kind of replicated, though. <laughs> we'll admit that, though. On the front gate will be replicated multiple times, though, but at least the lead-up is fine. Anyway, the front gate is a door, and essentially it's like the front gate leads into the showroom. The room that you're going to be in. Um, So anything past the gate is its own separate room. Guests will be greeted by the blast cycle vehicles and get on. Again, like I said, they're going to be the blast cycles, basically. There is going to be, like, a little sidecar for Grimm. Cast members will assist with getting VR headsets on people and getting everyone safe and, like, buckled up and everything. There will be some cubbies for personal belongings since there's no floorboard on the ride vehicle to put stuff in. Like, quite literally, it is like a motorcycle. Um, if you don't know the technology I'm referencing at all, um, oh, what's his name? Mike from the party? Yes, Mike from the party. He has a video and that's how I learned about the Twilight motorcycle ride. Um, it is wild. I'm literally obsessed with it. Anyways, if you want to hear more about that, that's a fantastic- I love that video so much. So, I wouldn't say it's, like, one of my comfort videos, but it's definitely a video that I have watched multiple times, just because I'm like, 
motorcycle ride. I don't even like Twilight all that much, but I'm like, motorcycle ride. I just love that so much. Anyways, like I said, this experience is like a video game, basically. Things render in real time, so guests really do feel like they're in control of the blast cycle. For people who have vision problems, the experience will be more audio heavy. I would say maybe the characters could be more vocal, like tree coming up on the left, but I don't know if that would really help. Like, I don't want the ride to feel like it's happening to people. I want them to feel like they're active participants, and I think characters giving directions might feel a little too much like the writer doesn't have a lot of agency. I think the better solution might be less obstacles, but I'll admit I'm not completely sure how to handle making the ride more accessible for people with vision problems outside of focusing on audio. I also think for like, and this could be something incorporated just to every ride experience, but I do think maybe it's like, oh, we have magic helmets. And so if you do need captions or sign language, there'll be either one, just captions on the VR headset, or there could be little like, um, I'm trying to think of like how to describe what I'm thinking. Basically have like, you know, the characters like kind of like, um, you guys know how in some sci-fi movies, like, when people are talking to different characters with, like, their fancy helmets and the character's, like, image will show up, but it's, like, kind of faded or it's, like, a a monochrome sort of thing, but you can still see it. I think maybe something like that with the opacity, like, lowered a little bit, so it's still legible to see what they're signing, but, like, you're still able to see stuff and not, like, crash or, like, have to focus on looking at the signing. Like, it's kind of dead in the middle of the screen, so you can kind of see and not have it be, like, too overwhelming, I hope. Again, I'm not sure if that would be the best solution for that, but I want to try- at least try and make the ride accessible for multiple kinds of people. And American Sign Language- at least this is what I've been told- American Sign Language and English are just, like, not the same thing, and so it's, like, I would rather have something in someone's, like, in, like, their mother language instead of, like, just them having to deal with other stuff, you know what I mean? I'm not really sure how to handle that exactly, but those are my thoughts. But yeah, so once everyone has their VR headsets on, it's time to start the actual ride. And also everyone's buckled in, but I feel like that's kind of a given. I don't understand why people would not want to wear a seatbelt on a ride. Um, I think that's weird, but okay. So anyway, we get on the ride, um, VR headsets on, and then, like, the actual, like, thing starts. So, the rest of the game pulls up in their own blast cycles. Everyone heads down the mountain towards Foothill Town and Craneport. There be some fun obstacles to avoid. Everyone's having fun going downhill. As you get close to the bottom, Deuce says for everyone to stop, and he'll give directions to the beach and take the lead. Sebek, who's not used to riding blast cycles, is unable to stop at the bottom. Everyone's annoyed as he just kind of goes careening into the forest, but they go after him. The terrain in the forest is rougher, and everyone gets freaked out when they find Sebek's blast cycle, but no Sebek. Jack says he hears something in the distance, and he leads the group into a clearing. Sebek is here, and in front of him is a phantom. Everyone panics and wants to ditch, but Jack goes in to get Sebek on his blast cycle. Everyone, like, Jack's blast cycle, not- they didn't, like, just drag Sebek's, but honestly, that would probably be for the best, but anyways- Um, everyone realizes having a phantom around is dangerous, so they decided to just take it down, especially now that Sebek and Jack are, like, engaging with it. Um, a battle happens with everyone circling the phantom and trying to avoid its attacks. Eventually, the phantom is subdued. Grim tries to get to the block crystal, but his seatbelt makes him unable to get out. Everyone hurries away since it's getting really late. Everyone gets to the front gate, exhausted. Deuce says the upperclassmen he borrowed these from will take care of them, so they should just, like, walk back to Ramshackle or their dorms and stuff and get some rest. And that's where the ride ends. Guests will remove their VR headsets and cast members will help people get out. The exit empties into the main building, like after like an elevator or some stairs, and into a little gift shop because of course it does. That's kind of what rides you. But yeah, that's my idea for a twist ride, albeit very rough, and a twist miniland itself. It's a fun thought experiment, but honestly, if twist ever got a ride, it would be at the Tokyo Resort since twist is huge over there and they've already done at least one part collab. And also, like, I've heard one story of an Imagineer pitching a Gravity Falls attraction at Disneyland, and the execs, like, just straight up refused because they didn't get it and they didn't think it would be popular, even though Gravity Falls is, like, one of the biggest cartoon to come out of Disney in years. Which is like, wow, you guys are really just out of touch, huh? But anyways, like, I still think it'd be fun to think of what could be, you know? Now that our main topic is done, let's move on to some questions. If you'd like to submit a topic for me to discuss or you have a suggestion, etc., you can submit them to my suggestion box, which will be linked down below. If I haven't read your question or suggestion yet, no, it's getting worked on. But yeah, let's go to question one. 
Cutie Katie, she, her asks, what happened to the princess girl after Malinar died? Thank you for the question. So I did some digging and I can't find anything about the Princess Glow or Magnificent Ember as Ian localized it. I don't know why they did that, but they did. Um, I think the name is fine, but with all due respect, I'm not calling it Magnificent Ember. I don't think it's a bad name. It's not that. It's not like a stubborn thing like I do with uh, Fellow, because I'm not fucking calling him Ernesto. Um, I'm just used to calling it Princess Glow. But yeah, like, so after Malinor's death, there's no word about what happened to it, so we can only guess. This is what I'm guessing happened, but I don't know and I don't have any supporting evidence. So after Malinor died, I'm assuming Henrik and the Dawn Knight took the Princess Glow Mage Stone from her body. They made a big deal about wanting it, so I doubt they would just leave it there with her. Henrik probably returned to their home country and Leia would use it to heal their father. Honestly, he probably didn't want that, but like, I think Leia's right on that one. I think that they should heal their dying father. The Dawn Knight would probably have to stay behind in the stolen Briarland land to keep control over it. After their father is cured of his illness, Leia goes back to the stolen land and calls it Bladevel and all that. Henrik keeps the Princess Glow in their home country, probably. I don't know. This is where I have at least some sort of evidence. I mean, it's in the form of logic, so it's not much, but it's something. After Malinor died, we know a lot of people took land from Briarland and called it their own, and there was a lot of fighting over resources. I think if Leia and the Dawn Knight had the Princess Glow, they probably would have been a lot better protected from their fellow vultures. But Bladeville only lasted, like, probably a few years. The Dawn Knight was probably in his 20s or 30s when he murdered Malinor, and Menopause hits in your 50s, so he and Leia would have only had a 20 to 30-ish year gap to have Silver, assuming they're the same age. Which, yeah, 20 to 30 years is a long time for most things, but in terms of a country existing, that's really short. And we do hear from the Protector Fairies that the kingdom only lasted a short time. That backs up that the kingdom probably only lasted, like, a few decades. The Princess Glow is probably still around and in some families, like, like, we do have, uh, god, who was it? I, th- I haven't read this, but I saw that, uh, you, they posted this. There's this one little, like, bit in Chapter 7 where there's this one human trying to sell stuff from, like, the Queendom of Roses. I don't know if that's really enough confirmation to say that that was their home country. Because I feel like they would have just said so, so, like, I don't know. But yeah, like, I don't know where their home country is, but I imagine that, like, considering all the intermarriage royal families do and stuff, the princess still is probably, like, still around, but in someone's, like, royal family jewel vault or something. Maybe it's still being used, but ultimately, we just don't know much for certain. Callie, she, her, asks, and before Chapter 7 released, what's your view on the Silver and your siblings, or at least somewhat related theory? Thank you for the submission. I don't know if I can really sum up my feelings on it in a nice little box. I never really thought about it all that much before Chapter 7. Like, I knew it was a thing, but again, I just never really thought about it. Especially before Chapter 7, because there was, like, very little evidence to support anything. At least that I know of. Again, I didn't really go there. I don't hate the theory. Um, that's not it at all. It was just never something I was really invested in all that much. I don't hate the theory at all, that's not why I don't really go there, but it was just never something I was really invested in at all. The only thing I can think of to hint to it is a super old and now deleted voice promo line, which the fact it's deleted is kind of weird, I will give you guys that. But it's where Silver asks if we met before. I don't remember the exact quote, but it definitely is a little like, hmm. Although I think he was referencing Once Upon a Dream with that line. Two things can be true at the same time, and also it can still be weird that they deleted it, especially considering they, like, paid him to say that. And I'm like, why are you wasting stuff? Anyways, currently I'm not heavily invested in it, but I think it would be an extremely interesting twist in something Jan is capable of doing, considering the twin twist in Black Butler. But at the same time, I still don't think we really have a lot of evidence to back it up. At least right now we don't. We don't know much about Blade Veil. Vale. Really, all we know is from that one flashback and then a few other lines. I think it's safe to say Lilia didn't know anything about the Dawn Knight's son prior to finding him, so it wouldn't surprise me if there was some kidnapping of children going on and he just didn't know about it. Like, considering the scenario is that, like, you and Silver are siblings and then you got kidnapped and that's why you wasn't there. That's really the only way I could see it working. If you was uh, Silver's sibling, obviously. Like, um, like they would have had to been kidnapped and taken to another world or something. That or Silver's sibling was kidnapped and you as their descendant, which maybe that's the case? Imagine if Yana was like, what if I did the twin thing again and Silver had a twin and that one got ki- Oh my god, I would be mad. I- 
Okay, listen, I know that, the, like, twin twist is not done as much in Japan. I know that it's, like, it's just not really done all that much. But it is so overdone here, and I just, oh my god, I hate, I, I hate those reveals. I hate them so much. It's like, oh, there's a no there's a twin, and I'm like, oh my god. I mean, that was one of my issues with Pretty Little Liars, the the book series, not the not the TV show. Um, I've got a lot more issues with that, but anyways, um, I just really don't like the tw it's like time loops. I really don't like twin reveals and stuff. I I just don't. I really don't. Although, come to think of it, Pretty Little Liars did do that though, because they had Spencer's um. <laughs> they had Spencer's a long lost twin who for some reason they decided to make British and they made that poor actress do like the worst British accent. At oh my god. Pretty Little Liars is fucking insane. Um, anyways, I feel like it would have to be like some kidnapping or something going on and then either you was the sibling or a descendant of the sibling. I think it would be like kind of interesting to go into that route. I mean, I would be mad about it because I don't like the twin reveal like I just went on a rant about off script. But also, I have to admit, I think I kind of prefer you not having any previous ties to Twisted Wonderland. I like the idea of getting isekai and it's like, you were never supposed to be here, but that doesn't matter now. We'll still carve out a space for you here and give you a home and love you all the same, which is what's going on with you right now. I don't think a relation reveal would 100% ruin that because you still has found family with their friends, but it would definitely put a damper on it because you should have always been there. But yeah, like, it's never been something I've been, like, super invested in all that much, really. I think it's an interesting thought. And again, Yana could absolutely do it, and I'm not gonna lie, part of the interesting is like, wow, you decided to do that again, didn't you? But I would say, honestly, I'm more or less apathetic towards it. I would be a little annoyed if it happened, but honestly, it's like, okay, I'm already here. Like, I'm not gonna leave over that, you know? Maybe if I got presented with some compelling evidence, I'd feel differently, or if things, like, change in the future, but honestly, I'm just kind of, like, meant to potentially mildly annoyed about it. But honestly, I'm more just like, okay, like, it's a theory, you know? A game theory. Oh my god. God, that reminds me of- I don't remember what- Oh, we were talking about twist theories in one of my streams last night, and I was like, I don't want to be the fucking map hat of Twisted Wonderland, which I don't. But now I'm just like, oh god, now I'm thinking of that. I'd rather be like the dual process theory or like the right host to Twisted Wonderland, quite honestly. But anyways, yeah, I'm not super invested in the relation, like, theory with Silver and you. But yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. We'll have to see on that one. Judas he him asked, do you think Twist could be as popular in the States and other parts of the world if Disney actually tried to promote the game and make merch available in their store's parks? Do you think it could ever reach levels like JJK or MHA? Thank you for the question. Honestly, yeah, I think if Disney actually promoted it, it would be a lot more popular. I don't think it could get to JJK or MHA levels, but like, I don't know why saying MHA is difficult for me, but apparently it is. Um, but like, I do think it could get as popular as, like, Kingdom Hearts, or maybe even more popular. I'm gonna be honest, parts of Twist feel like Disney's answer to Harry Potter, which, while it's not technically under Universal, Universal makes a shit ton of money from their Harry Potter stuff in their parks. Despite the fact J.K. Rowling is a Holocaust-denying transphobe who has actively made the UK a worse place for trans people, and uses her Harry Potter money to fund transphobic shit, which is why everyone told y'all to not buy Hogwarts Legacy, and some of y'all did. I think if Disney did more promotion, Twist could easily steal some of that crowd, and if they did Twist stuff at the parks, that could easily steal people from going to Universal. Yana's not a perfect ally by any means. Like, I just want to make that very clear. Yana has not been, like, the perfect ally. But from the interviews she's done, I get the impression she genuinely wants to try and do right by trans people with representation. I don't remember the interview that she did, but she was talking about Grell, and she was like, oh, I felt like I made her a little too much, like, comedic relief, and I really want her to be, like, a serious character. And, you know, she kind of tried to rectify that with, like, you know, future arcs and stuff. I mean, there's other stuff about Grell that it's, like, you know, it's not perfect, but, like, I, I get the feeling that she, like, wants to try at least. And considering the attitude towards gender in Twist, I feel like it would be a great alternative for Harry Potter fans that are rightfully uncomfortable with Rowling's transphobic bigotry. Like, if I spent money on Twist merch, I know that money isn't being used to fund transphobic legislation or transphobes in general. 
Honestly, Yana would probably just use it by Yaoi. Let's be real here. Plus, like, Twist's main demographic is women in their 30s. I've said in the past, like, we need to get the Disney adults on EN and they'll fund the game for, like, years. And honestly, I'm not completely joking. Disney adults love villains and Twist is a love letter to villains. I think if more Disney adults knew about Twist, they would quickly fall in love with it. Especially people my since we grew up with Harry Potter and magic schools. I think Twist has all the ingredients to be popular in the US, it's just there's no promotion. I will say, I really do wish merch was more readily available in the US. I honestly find it weird that like, I've bought Attack on Titan merch at Disney World before. This was like back, oh god, how old was I? This would have been like 2012, 2013. But like, I was able to buy Attack on Titan merch. Why can I not buy Twisted Wonderland merch at Disneyland? <laughs> I really think Disney should have at least some, like, gachapon or some shit in the Japan Pavilion at Epcot because, like, you can buy anime stuff there, so why no twist stuff? I mean, I know it's, like, a little department store that there, but, like, still, though, the point stands, you know? Especially since, like, if you have twist merch at the parks, it'll appeal not only to U.S. fans but Japanese fans as well. Disney World isn't a local park. You could do, like, a U.S. exclusive keychain line or buttons or something extremely cheap. I don't know. But yeah, like, I do think it'd be a lot more popular if it had more promotion uh, going on, especially outside of, like, anime fans. Twist has done promotion at AX, and to be fair, once at D23, but I think anime fans and people, like, that like Japanese stuff, they're already aware of Twist in Wonderland. The only time I run into Twist fans are at cons or staff members of the Angelic Pretty. I've only ran into Twist fans at Disney once. And it was some Japanese girls who were talking about my Malleus Ida bag, and then I had to speak to them in very broken Japanese and be like, oh my god, are you guys Malleus fans too? I think I gave them a heart attack because they were not expecting me to like turn around and be like super excited. <laughs> they were very apologetic and they were like, oh, we weren't like shit talking you. And I was just like, girl, don't worry. I, I wouldn't think that you were shit talking me. And, and to be fair, even if you were, like, big fair, because I do have a cringe bag, you know? But yeah, like, from when Twist came out to, like, a year or two ago, like, I went to Disney quite a few times, and that was the only time I had ever run into Twist fans. Like, ever. I mean, maybe it would be different if I was at Disney World, but, like, yeah, like, if you run into Twist fans, they're gonna be at conventions or, like, you know, Japanese subculture places. Like, they're not gonna actually be at Disneyland. So yeah, like, I think more promotion should be done on the Disney side of things. I would love for them to change up strategies, but like, it's been almost three years. I don't think they will, but I would love to be proven wrong on that. Because again, I do think the Disney adults would go insane for this, and um, again, they would fund the game for years. You know, I mean, JP makes like four million dollars a month. And I know that obviously that's helping to fund EN, but I'm like, if we get the, Di like, if we get the American Disney adults on this, like, it's gonna be printing money over here, so I don't know why Disney is, like, not doing it, you know? Like, maybe they just think it's too anime or, like, too subculture-y, but I'm like, girl, Disney villains, gay people, like, just, <laughs> you know what would actually be really funny if they did a whole bunch of, like, twist promotion during their Pride events? Because, like, Let's be real here, the majority of Twist fans in the U.S. are gay, or, like, some level- Well, I'm using gay as, like, you know, an umbrella term, but, like, let's be here, the majority of us are queer. God, that would be so funny. That- honestly, that would actually be extremely funny. But anyways, yeah, I think Disney should really put more promotion into it outside of, like, anime stuff and, like, you know, Japanese subculture people and, you know, try to get the Disney adult money. Yeah, I don't know what the hell they're doing over there. <laughs> I feel like they just kind of left Anaplex like, here you go, Anaplex, good luck, and then they're just not doing anything. And now for our final question, Yume She Her asks, I'm fairly new to Twist. I started playing five to seven months ago, so I don't really know a lot about the lore, but I want to know if it's possible that you isn't from our world. Thank you for your question. I think it's definitely possible. I think we've all assumed that they're from an alternate version of Earth where Disney isn't a thing, and I thought the game synopsis had specifically said you is from our world, but when I went back to reread it, it doesn't say that. It just says you're summoned to a world unlike your own. So, I think it's possible. Not to mention, with all the different yous like Yuka, Yuya, etc., I think it's possible they're from some different kind of world, considering, like, we don't see much of their world before their isekai to Twisted Wonderland. 
And for the game, like, I think it's possible, but I also think it's a bit more complicated. Like, you were supposed to be a stand-in for ourselves as the player, so naturally you'd think you would be from our world because we're you. But in the game, there's, like, subtle hints that you has their own motivations and personality. So it's, like, how much of you is ourselves and how much are they their, like, own character? I think it's a mix of the two, but honestly, there's also that to think about, especially when wondering if you is from our Earth as players know it. And also, there is promotional material that's like, oh, this is the story of you, but then it'll switch out, like... I mean, it'll show, like, you, like, why you, you, but then also you, like, the English pronoun you, you know? Um, so it's like, the players are definitely, like, a form of you, but you get what I'm saying, basically. I definitely think it's possible, and if it's not for the game protagonist, I think it's possible for the manga protagonists, or even Yuya. Alright, so before we finish the episode, I'm gonna give updates on other submissions. I have still not seen the Maleficent movie, so, um, we're still trying to find it. Um, I've collected all the entries submitted before October 25th, and they're in various stages of being worked on. Most are in the researching phase. The interracial relationship submission is about a third of the way written, and honestly, it's probably going to be its own video because I'm clocking in at a seven-minute read-through. Generally, for submissions, if what I wrote takes ten minutes or longer to read my full response, it's going to be its own video just because it's too big. Like, if I'm a third of the way through and it's seven minutes now, it's probably going to end up being, like, 21 minutes long. So, um, yeah, that would be a little too big for the podcast, so that one probably will end up being its own video, but that's kind of, like, the rule of thumb I give, because, like, I do like going into detail with my answers, but it's also, like, like, I don't want to include responses that are too long, and I would rather just do, like, a separate video on that, just so it's, like, not bogging down the podcast. So, yeah, that one is taking quite a bit of time, and that one's probably going to be its own video, so that's the update with that one specifically. Um, but everyone else's is still being researched and stuff, and then again, like I said, I'm still trying to figure out, um, how to get the Maleficent movie, because again, I don't know the good yo-ho, uh, and again, loose lips sink ships, so like, even if you know them, don't tell me. If you guys start talking about these things, that's how they get taken down, and that's not a good thing. Piracy is preservation. But I will find the Maleficent movie someday. I don't know where, but I will find it. And that's it for the month. Thank you guys for listening. If you'd like to send in a lore question or anything, feel free to use my suggestion box. It'll be linked down below. But yeah, I hope you guys have a great Halloween and an even greater day after Halloween when everything goes on sale. I'm so excited. Oh my god. Um, It's my yearly stock up of furniture and little accessories for daily wear because, uh, fun fact, I'm actually kind of goth. But yeah, um, I'm excited. It's, oh my god, I think I love that day even more than Halloween <laughs> because I also love saving money. But yeah, um, have a great Halloween and yeah, I'll see you guys later.